by people? Hello. Uh, that was uh, after this presentation. Now we have some kind of community meeting here. It will be pretty formal, but informal. We might sit there on stage. So if you have questions, talk about the roadmap, FluentD, FluentBit. Anwar and myself will be, you know, pretty happy to talk about that. So take it a more casual conversation if you want. So we will have this session for about 20 minutes, 30 minutes before the coffee break. So maybe a good time for feedback and, you know, talk more about the break. Thanks. And if you, you have like production scenarios you want to run by us or something like that, we'd be happy to, to take a look or like questions about monitoring, questions about you know, all, all sorts of stuff. Happy to chat about any of it. Okay. Hello, we have the, the first question here coming from Pandu. He's curious about all of you who is using aggregator is a single tone going direct into the persistent store. So some of the functionality of the aggregation is moving into the collector area. Yeah. Yeah. And my question was, so in Kubernetes, which is a managed environment, and the resources are are automatically, so you can spin up more and more and more sum of collector and aggregator together. Is there still value to have a separate aggregation level in compared to just getting the same functionality from a single um, container? In, I can base the answer on the use case that we see, right? In, it depends, on, for example, if I talk about, okay, if I talk about Calitia customers, it depends on the company size and what they are trying to accomplish and what are the security requirements involved, okay? For example, if you have a cluster with a hundred of nodes and these nodes are talking to a cloud service, most of the big companies don't want to share secrets with each node because of security reasons, right? Yeah, there might be solutions like Bolt or something that you can use to distribute the, the secrets, but some security policies and security teams might say you should not uh, expose secrets to the nodes, right? So you have to go through an intermediate layer. And that's why sometimes an aggregator or intermediate layer is required for that case. In other cases when the aggregator is needed, it's like, for example, I remember one case from one uh, financial institutions, it's like they said, we want to receive all the data in one aggregator because we have so many teams internally, like internal customers, that they don't follow our policies on how to structure the data, right? And we want to apply all the data sanitization in one place in our aggregator before hitting, you know, the destination or the final storage. The other case is like, my cluster or my distributed system is growing so much. Now I have 1,000, tomorrow I have 10,000 nodes, no matter if they're bare metal machines, Kubernetes or not. Uh, if all of these agents, for example, are talking to my local deployment of storage database, right? sometimes this database cannot handle the load right? and don't have all the tools in place for that because it's decided that I will need to manage this like a cluster, scale it up, scale it down, and it's really complex because sometimes you don't know when your load is going to increase. It's hard to predict. And so what they do, they put the aggregator <laughs> because they said in the aggregator, I will have a huge buffer in disk and I will make sure that the traffic goes kind of linear. Linear in always sending the same amount of traffic over the network, like, I don't know, 100 megabytes per second, always the same. And if the data gets delayed, that's fine. So it depends to case by case. In most, for example, that's why in FluentD, in FluentBit side, uh, I would say we are seeing the same. Users of FluentBit are always looking for more performance. They're doing aggregation now with FluentBit. And yeah, we're getting this demand, yeah, from OpenSearch, from Loki to, 
and also from security folks who want to get, make sure that the transition of the data gets in a safety way without sharing secrets or putting in risk other components of the environment. Thank you. Well, yeah. Any question is valid if you want to talk, if you want to blame us because we break something <laughs> that's valid. Okay, we have one question there. If you can, thank you. I feel like guilty in these positions, like <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, uh, a little question around um, uh, efficiency. So we are in the health uh, health industry, and in our business, uh, it sometimes is more important that the things are logged. So logging is more important than business logic. So, for instance, um, prescriptions. We have to log every prescription to go back and verify it. Uh, and my question is, um, now we are doing, we are uh, writing to a file, reading it into Fluent D and uh, stream it to Splunk. But we also have um, uh, looked at uh, streaming it via TCP. And the question is, uh, is it more efficient or is it much more efficient to stream it or then to write it, or this uh, real overhead in uh, the um, processing of the, the log input? What do you think? Okay, so the use case is health, medical information, safety is, as a priority, is above of performance, so you cannot lose data. Um, and you use InfluentD right now. Yeah, we are listening to And have you faced that Fluent D CPU goes so high at the moment, or it's not able to handle the load? No. Uh, so it's a the theoretical exercise, really. But it's uh, more of what way are we going to develop the platform? Because we are making a platform to take on services. So are we going to, do we have to um, suggest that they use uh, the, uh, streaming of logs or is it okay to you to write it to disk uh, in like large production? Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you a kind of a answer that might be mixed with some suggestions, right? So this is like if you are thinking about a platform and this platform might be there, an architectural perspective like two, three years, right? Because you, you will not change this in a few months, right? Once it hits production. Um, I would suggest that if you worry about that data must be safe pretty quickly, and in an efficient way, I would suggest maybe use Fluent Bet instead of Fluent D, right? Fluent D is efficient, but when you hit certain load, it might struggle a little bit and Fluent D is also a single thread process, right? So if you have more data to write, you struggle to send in more data to write over the network. In the Fluent Bed case, it, that is optimized in, even more because when you hit the data, and for example, in technical terms, when the input plugin receives the data, no matter if it's tail, TCP, or no matter the source, this data by default will be in memory, but you can enable the file system uh, like a secondary system where you're going to get a resilient copy of this data. And now, why the mechanism in Fluent Bit is more optimal than in Fluent D? Because we use a similar approach than databases. We use memory mapped files, so we reduce the number of system calls that are required to sync and write the data to disk. We found that that's been a times faster and less CPU intensive when it's about to write data to disk. Second, and that happens in one thread in Fluent Bed. Second, in the output side, the output plugin is Plank or Elastic or most of them runs in a separate thread. So this blocking step will not exist in there. 
right? So if you are writing a platform, uh, I will that you rely on data safety and I/O, I will go with Fluentbit, my suggestion, uh, because of threading, because of memory mapped files, and it's more optimized for those use cases. Now, once you get the data using that first safety step, like getting the data in a safety on disk and then re be prepared to ship the data out, I think that then doesn't matter if you choose Splunk S3 because you will have a backup of the data, right? One of the problems is, uh, is synchronization. Sometimes data is generated so fast and rotated so fast that the agent sometimes could not be able to pick up that data. Right? It depends on how noisy your application is. But um, yeah, I will base my, my suggestion on that. I don't know if that answered correctly, but if I'm going to think about a platform and think about IO data safety, I, I will implement Fluentbit with these features enabled. File system, threading the output, and yeah. So if FluentD will use, I don't know, for that a, a minimal use case, spend like 100 megabytes of memory, Fluentbit might use 10. OK, yeah. great uh, answer. And I have another one uh, around the operator. Um, how is the, uh, you have uh, the metric collection? Are you planning to add like custom resources to, uh, um, to make the developers able to create collections like in the Prometheus operator? You can uh, create a special um, a s service uh, monitor that automatically updates the, the scraping of a Prometheus. Do you plan to add this to, uh, to FluentBit so you can automatically configure a collection of metrics? Um, I have, this <laughs> sounds so weird, but I have not used the Fluent operator. Personally, I think that Android has more experience with that. Maybe he can answer that part. Yeah, I think uh, with, with the Fluent Operator's roadmap on metric collection, most of it's geared towards, um, it's a Q, I think they said Q3, uh, Q4, and that's the CubeSphere team. My guess is when you, when you look at the metric collection features that exist today, they're really geared towards having very firm knowledge about what you want to collect, right? Whether that's Node Explorer or the Prometheus uh, endpoint. With the operator, the intention at least is to be able to templatize that a little bit more. Um, and of course, one of the other benefits with the operator is all of the service discovery benefits you get. And that also occurs with logs, right? Wild cards and everything there. Uh, I think there's a lot to gain from what the Prometheus operator's already done uh, in, in that sense. Uh, but yeah, and in some cases, it, it might do some of the same feature sets, but in others, it would require so much implementation that, hey, why not just use the, the Prometheus operator in that case? Uh, so a bit of a mixed answer. Uh, but yeah, I, I'd say at least we, the way we like to look at it is we try to do what makes a lot of sense with, with Limpit, but not just try to do 100% replica copy. Uh, like Node Exporter, we, we don't have full Node Exporter capabilities. That team's worked amazing on, on building that full functionality, and we've brought over some of the best pieces of it, but not, not the entirety. Um, yeah, and actually I wanted to, one of the other pieces from the, the previous question too about like whether you should stream the data or uh, buf uh, buffer to disk. Either way works uh, really well. If you think about Kubernetes, all of that is being written to disk anyways, uh, right? It's all a container log. And we continually update the offset. So in the chance that something is to happen in the daemon set or the process dies, when it restarts, it knows exactly where to resume from. And uh, I think, Maybe it's it's my own bias, but sometimes when you know exactly where you left off, there's a file there, you feel a little safer, right? Uh, that being said, the chunks are just the same exact for the same exact data, but just formatted a bit different. So uh, either way works. Yeah.
Yeah, all good. I think we have uh, two minutes for one more question because we have the coffee break. Anyone else? Or if you want to ask for some enhancement request, happy yeah. to hear about it. No feature requests. Yeah, it looks like IBM is thinking about a new feature request. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <There> <laughs> Um, I saw in one of the slides in about Fluent Operator that they have multiple CRDs or custom resource definition for each source or output or filter. Like, why don't you combine each of them in one? I mean, what led you to make that decision to have multiple CRDs? I have a question about, around that. Because in general, either you re read from it or you don't. You, I don't know if it leads to a situation where you need to vary your parameters. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. You know, I, and I don't want to speak on behalf of the CubeSphere team, but one of the thoughts at least that I would have around it is that you might, you essentially are constructing a single pipeline. Um, and the, the Fluent Operator is taking the distinct pieces of those, those sources, filters, and outputs, and then just bridging them, them all together. And while, yes, that could be done with a config map, you might want to update the sources independently and not affect kind of the remainder of the, the pipeline. So I think that was one of the, the intentions, of course, not, not trying to put words in the, the cubes here folks' mouth. But uh, yeah, one of the, I, I think that was one of the big things. And also, if you look at how some of the services interact with those CRDs, they are very much like drop downs of, hey, click your source, click your filter, click your output. Um, and I think that works well when each of those is a, is a separate custom resource. So. so do you combine all these CRDs to form one config and then, so but if you want to change like, let's say one of the sources, you like let's say in Fluentd you don't have the option to dynamically reload your config. Anyway, you will have to restart, right? So how does that affect your CRD? Like if you have only one, that will like you will have to construct the config again. Yes. So, so Fluentd one Fluentd does support dynamic reload, um, but I get what you're saying. Like even if you change four or five sources, you're still get, the process still needs yeah. to be updated. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's, that's absolutely true. Uh, I think, again, it was probably more for the convenience of just having each of those objects independently managed. Modularize. Down. Yeah, because okay. uh, if you think about it as one giant object of configuration, you would have to parse that out and make those each individual configurable elements versus just having them as individual configurable elements. So, so, like, how do you support, like, you can have many filter plugins, right? So how do you support the parameters as they come along? Mm. Yeah, good, good question. You know, I think with the filters, they're primarily based off of the, um, all that object does is has a match in it. And so it treats everything as a giant pipeline. Um, I, I don't necessarily know if it's doing anything too unique in the sense of saying, okay, this belongs to this label, this label, or this label. I, I could be 100% wrong, but uh, that's, that's at least my initial uh, understanding of it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that was, that was pretty good. Uh, we, we have community meetings, by the way, every uh, Thursday, every two weeks, uh, Thursdays, we do a rotation, uh, two in North America, uh, late uh, European time and then one uh, European and Asia Pacific time. So actually Mickey's led on one of those meetings before. I, I lead some, we have Pat who leads some others. So uh, it's would, would love to have more folks join us. We talk about roadmap, what we're building, help with specific use cases. Uh, so yeah, always encourage more and more folks. And those are all recorded so you can watch them on YouTube as well. 
Uh, okay, I think let's go ahead and break for coffee and uh, then we'll circle back here, I think, after 15, 20 minutes. Just double check. Yeah, we get back here at 310 um, for the next session. So about 15 minutes. Okay. <laughs>